This is Jay Martin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here I am once again with Rick Rule. Rick, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for making the time. Jay, a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back. So today I want to focus on the energy sector, specifically about uranium. Um, there's a lot of people talking about the energy crisis in Europe and how nuclear could have prevented this. And do you agree? Let's start there. Do you agree with that, that had European countries invested maybe appropriately in the nuclear sector, that the leverage Russia now holds, all of this crisis could have been averted and Germans wouldn't be worried about how they're going to heat their homes this winter? Absolutely. Now, in fairness, uh, nuclear for baseload power uh, and then natural gas for peaking power, uh, mm. you, it, it would have been convenient to have both. But had uh, the whole of the European continent had, as an example, the same energy mix that France has now, Europe yeah. wouldn't have a problem and Putin wouldn't have very much leverage. Now, if that's the case, and it seems to be mainstream consensus that, that nuclear could still be the solution, if not now, then soon down the road, is uranium still a contrarian bet right now? Would you say it is or it isn't? I would say that uranium is a contrarian bet. Uh, it, it is still estimated that the total production cost of current uranium, and by total, I don't mean the AISC, I mean, including cost of capital, uh, in, including social rents, which mm. is to say taxation, royalties, and fees. Yeah. And, and importantly, uh, capitalizing and amortizing failed projects, which the industry sel seldom seems to want to do. Mm -hmm. If you look at the total cost to produce a pound of uranium around the world today, it hovers around 60 US dollars per pound. So the industry makes the stuff for 60 and sells it for 52, losing $8 a pound <laughs> yeah. 125 million times a year. Uh, the fact is that any industry where the product sells for less than the cost of production, any industry that's in liquidation is almost certainly a contrarian play. Sure. There's also psychological elements to contrarianism, which is to say, still, when I'm uh, on an investment podium talking about the economics of uranium, there will always be somebody in the audience who describes me as despicable scum attempting to profit on uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. Sure. So from a contrarian's point of view, that's lovely. The idea that the sector is hated means uh, al almost certainly that the sector is cheap. Uh, and I continue to believe that relative to its utility, sector is cheap. The, se the sector, uranium is cheap. What really attracts me, though, to uranium now, Jay, is my... Uh, then protege, now peer, uh, Steve Sugarroot, uh, once said that you need to find a sector that is cheap and unloved, but on the rebound. Mm -hmm. the time value of money mattered. If you were six years too early uh, at a 10% discount, you weren't early, you were wrong. Yeah. And I would suggest to you that the exciting thing about uranium is that it is cheap, it is unloved, but it's already bottomed and is, is on the way up. The time for uranium has been in the future for a very long time, but mm. I would suggest to you, Jay, that the future is 2022 and 2023 rather than some distant future. You're right, because whenever, you know, at my events, for example, whenever we've hosted anything uranium focused over the last eight years, at least in my memory, you know, the attendance to those sessions has been disproportionately strong. Uranium bulls are incredibly loyal and they're always seemed to be a uranium bull market just around the corner, you know, like it was just, you could taste it, you know, but it never quite arrived. M maybe things are different now, given, I guess, the the pressure, right? The, and the leverage that, uh, that uh, Russia is able to play right now. You know, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, I think one in five homes in the United States are powered by nuclear. That's correct? No, uh, it's... That's close. Okay. Twenty percent of the baseload power in the United States is nuclear. Got okay. Nuclear got it. Yeah. Probably eighty-five percent of the homes. Twenty percent of the baseload and thirteen percent of total electricity consumption in the United States is nuclear. Right. But uh, the number of homes served is much, much, much larger. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, pretty clearly in the United States, as else as elsewhere, 
they say that a 3% discrepancy, that is to say a 3% plurality between capacity and demand is enough to give you a brownout. California will have brownouts today and tonight. Uh, if the price of uranium doesn't go up to the cost of production, uh, and you take away 13% of total energy supply in the United States, 20% of baseload supply, you turn the lights out. Yeah. Simply, you turn the lights out. Uh, and when people who want to understand the gross economics of uranium come to understand that over five or six years, the price of uranium has to return to a level that allows producers to earn their cost of capital, or the lights go out. If you ask them uh, what's more probable, obviously they think that the price of uranium has to go up, and that's my case. So, what is what is the big change? If you say that you know 2022, 2023 is now the future, this is the rebound. What is the yep. big shift that's different from four or five years ago? Four things: timely uh, energy security, uh, the fact that the Russian adventure in Ukraine and the increasing nationalization of resource supply chains has meant that nations and societies are more concerned than they have been for 30 years about energy security. And uranium is the most secure fuel of all. It's the most energy dense fuel in the world. There is no way that a country like Korea or Japan or Taiwan could store enough coal or liquefied natural gas on their own shores to supply them energy security, but uranium can. So the first is political concern about supply. The second is that there's an increasing technical realization around the world that uranium is in some senses a green fuel. Yeah. There has been a redemption in the mind of many people, but particularly in the mind of the people in Japan, where four years ago, 21% of the population favored restarting their nuclear fleet and now 61% of the population favors restarting the nuclear fleet. The former uh, co-founder of Greenpeace has come out solidly in favor of nuclear energy as a way to combat uh, you know, greenhouse gases. Yes. The third yes. thing that happened is that my former employer, Sprott Inc., with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, tightened up the spot market. That's now 55 million pounds of physical uranium that are out of the spot market, which went a very long way <laughs> to tightening up the oversupply in the spot market. But the most important in the very near term, Jay, has been the pace of Japanese restarts. Uh, I've stood okay. at your podium for several years saying that the uranium market will change markedly when the Japanese nuclear reactor fleet starts up. The Chinese construction impacts demand five years from now, six years from now, 10 years from now. The restart of the Japanese nuclear fleet impacts demand right now, and it impacts demand in a market where 55 million pounds have been taken out of the market. Uh, extremely important. Okay, and can you elaborate on that 55 million pounds for me? Yeah, the 55 million pounds that came out went to the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. That's it, okay. There was a, yeah. there was a substantial plurality of inventory after the Fukushima shutdown the Japanese electric industry consumed between 20 and 25 million pounds of uranium a year. Uh, and that consumption went to consumption heaven after Fukushima. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it just built up and built up and built up and built up and built up in the spot market. It's important to note that in the post Fukushima years, demand for uranium has increased to the point where even before Japanese restarts, the worldwide uh, nuclear generating industry was was utilizing more uranium than they had prior to the Japanese shutdown. So mm. the Japanese shutdown in one sense now is, uh, oh, pardon me, the Japanese restart is icing on the cake. What's important is that it's timely icing on the cake. It isn't icing that we get to eat five or six years from now. It's sure. icing that we get to eat in 2022 and 2023. Okay. That's interesting. So the biggest catalyst of those four is the pace of Japanese restarts because of the time horizon for those reactors to correct. go back online, correct? correct? Right. And we can think about that in terms of like 12, 18, 24 months, which is a near term time horizon. Why you say 22, 23. And importantly, if you want to get into the weeds, the increase in Japanese consumption coming on the heels of tightening of the spot market, which occurred over 10 years naturally, and then over the last 18 months because of the Sprott Physical Trust. Okay. That's important too, because utilities have come to rely on the spot market. 
for supply. They haven't been concerned about security of supply because there was too much inventory. Now the utilities in the next fuel cycle are going to have to scramble for fuel. And that means that more of them, rather than relying on the spot market, will go into the contract or term market. That in turn is important because producers will be able to tie in supply contracts where the prices are known. Uh, they will, as an example, Cameco has said that they won't restart any production until they have sufficient term contracts to guarantee a reasonable rate of return to their shareholders. Earnings increases that are visible and sustainable through term contracts will do wonders for the ability of junior producers to finance production and senior productions and senior producers to have identifiable revenue streams that will raise their share prices and lower their costs of capital. Is it, Rick, I, I feel like I'm a, a bit surprised you didn't mention, um, you know, Russia and the Kazakh supply not making it to the Western market as one of those catalysts. Uh, uh, are you surprised by that or what do you think? So I don't think that the Russian supply is particularly consequential. The okay. Russians' ability in enrichment and re-enrichment is very important. The Russians control about 40% of the enrichment capacity in the world. Yes. What that means is that we're overfeeding, uh, that we are not doing as much recycling of existing fuel, and we are throwing higher quality fuel uh, at reactors, which does increase demand. The Kazakh supply uh, thus far has not been kept off of market. Uh, the Kazakhs have been, I think they've done a masterful job politically of maintaining their ability to sell fuel to all buyers. And my own contacts within Kazatomprom says that Kazatomprom, uh, the company, and Kazakhstan, the nature, the nation, pardon me, uh, values all of their customers, uh, irrespective of political loyalty. Okay. So maybe I had that. I thought that all of that product, though, had to go through the port at St. Petersburg, but is that not correct? Uh, my understanding is that nuclear fuel, whether it finds its way out uh, of St. Petersburg or whether it finds its way out through China and Mongolia, has been finding its way to market. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. All right. So let's talk about then the uh, junior producers you mentioned. Because my question is like, okay, Japan restarts these reactors. Where is the supply going to come from? Where And that's to say, you know, where should investors be looking right now? Well, the, the near-term increases in supply will come from mothballed capacity at Cameco and uh, Kazatomprom. Uh, there is a structural deficit in the uranium market now of about 75 million dollars, 75 million pounds, pardon me. When you look at uh, mines that are currently in production. If you add back mothballed capacity, there's between 35 and 40 million pounds of supply that could be brought back onto production between Cam Cameco and Kazatomprom. Okay. You will see that occur, according to both companies, when they have uh, contractual commitments for uh, enough of that new supply that they can earn a reasonable return on capital employed. What's important to note is that the Combin well, the 75 million pound structural deficit, first of all, is before Japanese restarts. Uh, right, right. And the 75 million pounds uh, was a number that looked to be constant as a consequence of the de continued decommissioning of reactors around the world, including in the United States and Germany. Uh, that looks like it won't be happening for a while. <laughs> mm. uh, so it looks as though that structural deficit will grow even before the demand that is created by new reactor construction in Korea, Taiwan, and China. Uh, and that's where the opportunity comes for the smaller developers with newer production. Okay. Okay. Uh, what do you think about the Athabasca Basin as a jurisdiction, Rick? Uh, the second best jurisdiction on the planet. Uh, geologically, the best jurisdiction on the planet is Kazakhstan, the lowest cost, highest volume, uh, the most projects in the pipeline. But uh, Cameco will always be blessed by being in a country where, uh, at least partly, the rule of law applies. Uh, Saskatchewan is uh, thus far a very, very, very pro extractive country. Yeah. The yeah. industry going all the way back to Uranerts and Cameco has done a good job 
maintaining good relationships with indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in northern uh, Saskatchewan. And the basin still has a hell of a lot of uranium. <laughs> I mean, the new discoveries that we're seeing up there uh, after years of exploration are still heartening. But we're at the point now where we've explored the Athabasca Basin for so long mm -hmm. that the industry is beginning to understand what works, which is to say the exploration technology has advanced far enough that I think that you're going to be that you're going to begin to see more efficient exploration. It's going to be much less needle in a haystack stuff. Okay. Uh, much more maybe using a, a magnet to find that needle. Uh, so I'm I'm attracted to the Athabasca Basin in every regard. There are still, in, in the western part of the basin, where Fission and NextGen are as an example, there are still infrastructure challenges. You know, you're 350 miles northwest of nothing. <laughs> mm. it's, uh, and so there are going to be uh, challenges. But the challenges are going to be able to be overcome. The industry's got a lot of experience in the basin going back a long, long, long ways. And I think most of the more serious mistakes have been made. Do you expect further consolidation after you know UEC's takeover of UEX or buyout? Is this, you know, do you expect more MA activity? There's a lot of companies in the basin right now. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, consolidation is really good. It's the only way I know of that you can reduce general and administrative expenses relative to assets under management. Yeah. And that's the great unspoken sin of the Canadian mining industry. We waste too much money on GNA. Yeah. Uh, it's also a way that a, a good management team can avail themselves of more investment choices. If you have five projects to advance rather than one, you are less inclined to waste money on one that guarantees your employment for the next 18 months. Yeah. Uh, the downside of that is that the team that gets acquired it usually goes to employment heaven, uh, and they don't like that. And most management teams regard true yield uh, as not yield to investors, but rather salary and emoluments to officers and directors. So there's a strong structural bias among managers against amalgamation. I hope you'll see it. Uh, I think... Mm that the Australian market is less forgiving than the Canadian market with regards to inefficient managements. And I think where you'll see more uh, M&A take place will be among the Australian juniors, the Australian domicile juniors, irrespective of where they're operating. I think Canadian capital markets have been and will continue to be too generous to the issuers. How do we fix that, Rick? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm at age 69, becoming more discriminating as to who I write my checks to. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Now, if you're talking to, uh, we've got some viewers that are watching this show right now, they don't have a dollar invested in the uranium sector. They're incredibly curious about how to get some, how to get a horse in the race. You know, where do they start? What advice do you have for this individual? This is going to sound like a Sprott commercial and it may sure. be, uh, yeah. if, you want an investor who is willing to devote substantial time to understanding the sector and your portfolio, or you're an investor with a life, you need to consider having a passive approach to the sector. I've told people on your podium back to the time when it was your father's podium rather than your podium, that the number of stocks an individual investor should have should correspond with the number of hours per month that he mm. or she is proposed, prepared to work on their portfolio. So if you're prepared to work 10 hours a month, you should have no more than 10 stocks. For most investors that have less than $100,000 in the space, they can't afford the number of hours that they have to spend per month on their portfolio because they can do better working their existing jobs. Sure. For those investors, I would suggest very, very, very simply a 50% position in the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and a 50% position in the ETF, the URNM. That gives you the near-term, almost certain upside around physical uranium with the leveraged upside available in the stocks without having to do the work to identify the individual stocks. I believe that the uranium market beta, which is to say the delta in performance between uranium equities and the broad market will be broad enough that a passive approach for most small investors will work fine. For those investors who like doing the work or for those investors who are seeking alpha, for those investors who, like me, are addicted to the hunt for 10-baggers, 
then the circumstance becomes very different. We've identified 77 listed uranium companies, either producers or explorers worldwide. And we think that 13 of them <laughs> uh, either merit investment or speculation, uh, which is to say that less than 20% of the issuers worldwide we think are worth consideration. The ETFs, all of them by their nature, come further down the quality trail because they're mostly uh, involved in market liquidity and market capitalization. So if you're seeking alpha, you have to do the work. You have to separate the wheat from the chaff. People are going to be blowing me up right now asking for your list of 13, Rick. Any, <laughs> what can you share? Well, I'll give you a hint. Uh, any of your listeners that care what I think about their uranium stocks can find out easily for free. Uh, go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource holdings, uranium or not. Please no crypto. Please no tech stocks. Please no pot stocks. Yeah. Uh, and I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. Caveat, my highest ranking right now is a three. <laughs> I'll also be patient. I'm about 350 ranking requests behind. All right. If you want to find out in elliptical fashion what I think of your uranium stocks, uh, I'm happy, happy to tell you. I can say for most Canadian investors, start with the best. Start with Cameco. It's not mm -hmm. cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't, frankly, as high a quality as a company as Kazatomprom. But it comes with certain advantages, a non-opaque political system, a non-opaque financial regime, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trades on a Canadian exchange. You could do worse than limiting your exposure to the biggest and the best. Uh, wouldn't be as much fun, but if you're just there to make money, not necessarily to have fun, you start with the best. All right. I like it. So for anybody who's just new to the sector at the Basque Basin, based in Saskatchewan. I mean, yes, this is a province that could have the world by the balls with its resource endowment, you know, if managed properly. Uh, second highest grade uranium deposit in the world. Um, reasonably predictable, safe, just governing most of the time. <laughs> and uh, and send your list to ruleinvestmentmedia.com and Rick will qualify your top 10 holdings. And this is not just uranium, just as an aside. They can send you gold, silver, copper, right? Any any resource company. Any resource company. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Look, Rick, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming back on. Jay, a pleasure. Thank you for having me back, particularly to talk about uranium. As you know, it's one of my favorite topics going back at least 20 years. No doubt. No doubt. And I know why. All right. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. All right, thank you for watching this interview. Now, three things before I let you go. Number one, I publish a weekly newsletter and I love writing it. I share my biggest takeaways and action items from the conversations that I have on this channel. In addition, my thoughts on current events, economic events, political events, and you can subscribe for free. Just hit the pinned comment right beneath this video or just go to jmartin.club and you can subscribe on the website. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, ad revenue from this channel is donated to an organization that is super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Now, Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. And the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally positive influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, thanks again.